A hundred years ago today, Tulsa, Oklahoma, had one of the wealthiest African-American neighborhoods in the United States. It was called the Black Wall Street at the time, but within days it was left a smoldering ruin and hundreds had been killed, black residents murdered by white mobs, many of which had been organized alongside the police and the National Guard. And then the remarkable story of what's been called the worst race massacre in American history just disappeared. Well, this 100th anniversary sees the republication of an eyewitness account by Mary Jones Parrish, an African-American journalist who was in the thick of it. In a moment, we'll speak to her granddaughter, Annalise Bruner, who is herself a writer and an editor. But first, let's hear from the survivors of that terrible massacre. I'm a survivor of the Tulsa race massacre. Two weeks ago, I celebrated my 107th birthday. <laughs> Today, I'm visiting Washington, D.C. for the first time in my life. I'm here seeking justice and I'm asking my country to acknowledge what happened in Tulsa in 1921. Still, Greenwood should have given me the chance to make, truly make it in this country. Within a few hours, all of that was gone. The night of the massacre, I was awakened by my family. My parents and five siblings were there. I was told we had to leave, and that was it. I will never forget the violence of the white mob when we left our home. I still see black men seen being shot, black bodies lying in the street. I still smell smoke and see fire. I still see black businesses being burned. I still hear airplanes flying overhead. I hear the screams. I have lived through the massacre every day. Our country may forget this history, but I cannot. My name is Hughes Van Ellis. And I am 100 years old, and I am a survivor of the Tulsa Race Massacre. Because of the massacre, my family was driven out of our home. We were left with nothing. We were made refuge in our own country. The survivors there of the Tulsa massacre. Well, my first guest on the program today is the writer and editor Annalise Bruner, great granddaughter of Mary Jones Parrish, who documented the remarkable story of the Tulsa, Oklahoma massacre a hundred years ago. And Miss Bruner joins me now from Tulsa. Thank you very much indeed for taking the time to talk to us. Um, we appreciate that very much indeed. Uh, just tell us more about what happened during that terrible day of violence in 1921 in Tulsa, Oklahoma, as you heard it. I'm so glad to be with you today. I have heard this story over the years, uh, but I did not find out about it until I myself was an adult, 34 years of age, when my father, uh, gave me the book that my great-grandmother, Mary Jones Parrish, wrote and privately published in 1923. It was a day unlike any other, not only in Tulsa, but in American history. For something like this to have happened on American soil was unthinkable. That's what I felt when I first heard this story, and I imagine others will feel the same. Airplanes were flying overhead. Vigilantes were marauding through the community, performing drive-by shootings. Children as young as 10 had been enlisted with guns to massacre anyone they saw on the street. They looted, they burned, they killed. And as they came through the community, where my great-grandmother, who was a teacher as well as a writer, uh, had her school and her home. My young grandmother, Florence Mary, was looking out the window and told her mother, I see men with guns. My great-grandmother rushed to the window 
And indeed, there were men with torches, burning buildings, businesses, homes as they came, flushing people out and shooting them dead in the street. My great grandmother prayed to God, asking for guidance. What should she do to save herself and her young daughter? She decided it would be better to be shot on the street than to be incinerated within her home. They left their apartment, ran down to the street, and someone from the community who saw them said, get out of the street with that, kill, with that child or you will both be killed. She fled north on Greenwood Avenue, trying to find a place of refuge. She was heading toward a friend's home, but ultimately she was picked up on the back of a truck from some passing friends and uh, carried out of, the, out of the city to a place where people were gathering, tattered and torn, some shoeless, some hatless, with nothing uh, but the clothes on their back. This was a, a massacre of the highest order, a terrible atrocity, and it was precipitated supposedly by uh, a, an event at the courthouse where vigilantes, white vigilantes, had gathered to uh, presumably, and this was not something that was unusual, to lynch a young man who had been accused falsely of a crime. Well, I have to say that, I mean, thank you very much for setting that out. I mean, it just sounds like an absolutely harrowing experience and 100 years on, still very fresh in the minds of people like yourself, a 35 block area destroyed in less than 24 hours. And 100 years later, the victim survivors uh, and descendants of that massacre have never received as much as restitution, let alone reparations, have they? No, they have not. Because for a very long time, there was even a struggle to acknowledge, to have officials, the country itself. We heard Mother Fletcher. We want to have this acknowledged. It was contested over so many decades People were silenced. People who were waiting for justice, restorative justice, reparations, even insurance payments, they died without ever coming to any kind of satisfactory re uh, resolution. So we're still talking about this because it took so, one of the reasons, we, it took so very long for there even to be consensus around whether or not it had happened unimaginably. Well, I mean, what I'm, what I'm curious to know is that in the decades that have followed, um, how much has what you have just described been acknowledged by the people who were so clearly on the wrong side? I mean, in a hundred years, has the city of Tulsa acknowledged the race massacre or their complicity in what occurred? A commission was established and th there has been acknowledgement at this point. However, the demands for reparations have been rebuffed. Uh, the mayor uh, recently said that Tulsans today should not be punished for the crimes of the past. And I would say to him, is it a punishment really? Or is it an opportunity to see justice done and to be a participant in doing the right thing for those who suffered uh, loss of life, uh, their descendants, and for those who are uh, still waiting, as is uh, Mother Fletcher at 107 years old. This woman needs to have uh, her claims, her cause acknowledged, and she needs to be made whole. And I mean, from what I understand, as many as 500 whites were deputized and uh, in becoming deputized, that, that gave them the power of life and limb over black Tulsans. And the argument of the city was that these blacks were in rebellion against Tulsa. And that was why the restriction occurred. But of course, nothing could be further from the truth, as you mentioned. Absolutely. That was the convenient narrative 
so that they could escape the guilt, uh, the assignation of responsibility for having carried out this horrible atrocity against their fellow Americans. The people of Tulsa, over the years, over the decades, were able to hide what they had done because not only was their loss of life, loss of livelihood, they actively looted the businesses and the homes. After the massacre itself, service workers, domestic workers, went into the homes, returned to their jobs, working for white Tolsons, and saw their own and their neighbors' possessions in the homes of those who had come with shopping bags on a shopping spree. Right. Well, I mean, that, I have to say, uh, Annalise, that's an absolutely extraordinary story. Um, instead of trying to de-escalate the crisis, the city of Tulsa weaponized the mob. Please stay with us. We want to talk with you some more. You're watching The Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with Annalise Bruner, relative of one woman who survived the Tulsa massacre and documented the day's extraordinary events. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Zanyagulu. Now, 100 years ago today, between May the 31st and June the 1st, 1921, white mobs rampaged through an affluent black neighborhood in the city of Tulsa in the U.S. state of Oklahoma. Hundreds of black citizens were killed and thousands were injured. Homes and businesses were looted and burnt to the ground. Within about 16 hours, the entire area had been obliterated. Well, many regard what happened as the worst race massacre in U.S. history. We were taught not to even think about that, not to even do nothing. I mean, you know, hush, hush. We had to hush up and we never talked about it. All that is a, what do you call it, tour attract, tourist attraction? Just using the name. And that really disturbs me when they use that name like that. They have to remember when they're coming to visit that the survivors never received any type of reparations. Uh, they never received any type of benefit and they never really asked for anything. But I think it needs to be acknowledged that we have to do better in what we're doing far as supporting a group of people. And we still have much lack in North Tulsa. So I hope when they come to visit, that they just don't stop at the corner block of Greenwood and Archer, but they begin to move for further north and begin to patronize black African-American businesses in North Tulsa. And the writer and editor Annalise Bruner, great granddaughter of Mary uh, Jones Parrish, uh, who documented the remarkable story of the Tulsa, Oklahoma massacre 100 years ago, is still with me from Tulsa. Thank you very much indeed for staying with us. And your great grandmother saw all this. Uh, she was a journalist. She witnessed the killing, the looting, the burning, and she documented it all. Why did she do that? Might she have feared that the event would just disappear into the annals of history? Had that been her fear, she would have been absolutely correct. But I think that because it was a, such a vibrant, such a self-sufficient and such a self-possessed community of people, they knew that they could not rely on anyone else to tell, the, tell their own stories. So they uh, mobilized, they got the monies together and they self-published this volume. Uh, at a cost of, I think, between $900 and $1,000. And they privately published uh, between 25, 26 uh, copies. Uh, that some of the originals do still exist. And uh, I think that they knew that history would be altered were they to permit anybody else to tell their stories. So their civic organizations came together, put these monies together, and my great grandmother, I believe, was the secretary of one of these organizations. And they decided they were going to, as with everything else in their community, do it for themselves. And they, they uh, distributed the copies. I have one of the original copies, which is uh, one of the original uh, runs, my, given to me by my father, entrusted to me, I should say, along with the charge to do something with this. And I feel that I was destined almost to uh, 
re have my uh, grandmother's legacy reemerge and for her to be recognized for the important role that she served as a documentarian of history in real time and I certainly believe that they be they thought that no one else was going to do this and that they had to and in terms of the reemergence of that your great great grandmother's experience you are now planning to republish the book tell us about that and when we can expect to catch sight of that republication the book actually was republished on the 25th of may uh, and it is available at tulsabook.com trinity university press in san antonio uh, published the book, and I found out that they had planned to, in January of this year, I'd let them know of my existence, and they invited me to write a new afterword uh, linking those historical events with the same things that we see in society today. Uh, abuse by law enforcement, uh, public policy that seeks to discriminate uh, and exclude um, we also have issues of land use. Um, we have issues uh, of uh, uh, complicity by public officials in violence by mobs who are seeking to overturn the will of the people. And so this is a very important and timely book, uh, even as it has unfolded over the past almost 100 years. Again, that's TulsaBook.com. The Nation Must Awake by Mary E. Jones Parish, as applicable and uh, important and central to the political life of the United States as it was at that time. She cried out, is democracy a mockery? We must work hard to make sure that it is not. It's not something that happens automatically. And there are interests that want to change the truth of history, but you know, Truth is not optional. Truth is required. Truth is central to reconciliation. And so if we really want to get along in a way that is fair to everyone, we really must agree that the truth must be told. It must be acknowledged. People have a, to happen, have an opportunity to atone for what they have done, including at the city and state level, so that we can move forward together as a nation. Those are very important words that you, you've uttered there. And um, that book um, is extremely important. I will certainly make sure that I get a copy of it. And I think everyone ought to have a copy on their shelf. Um, but this centenary coincides, of course, with a year after the murder of George Floyd. Uh, you've touched on some of those contemporary issues. But how does this inform your thinking when you look at the American record currently on race, equality, and justice? The picture is not particularly pretty at this moment. We have continued to have uh, members of the community, unarmed members of the community, killed by law enforcement. And this conversation has been pushed by young people primarily to the forefront, and it must continue. It is not a conversation that can be silenced. We cannot afford it the way the Tulsa massacre was silenced for so many years, decades even. And so we are still having these conversations and we must understand at this moment, it's time to move from conversation to action. And I think that young people uh, who are, some of whom are learning about this for the first time uh, are empowered. They have agency, they are intrepid, they have a platform, they have a voice and they are making their voices heard. The pressure that comes from that, um, that will of the people, if you will, young people who refuse to be silenced, cannot be overlooked, cannot be over uh, ignored. And so um, I do have hope. I think that we have made progress. It would be uh, disingenuous to uh, uh, kind of imply that we have not. However, there is still very far to go. And I think that the young people are up to the task. Well, absolutely. And uh, just on, on that issue of uh, progress, of course, on the occasion of George Floyd's murder, the, the white officer was held accountable. And I'm wondering if that sends a signal 
to you as a clear sign of progress? And we've got a minute before we have to end the chat. Well, I feel that people are aware that, that certain things have been happening with impunity. And with that awareness comes agency. It comes urgency. And I think that uh, we are taking up the mantle of leadership to uh, fight this notion that people can get away with these kinds of things. They must be held accountable. We cannot accept uh, that, that, they, that they are not. And we do have a starting point with the officer who took the life of uh, an innocent person on the street before the eyes of the very world. And uh, we will not be silenced. I want to thank you very much indeed, uh, Annalise Bruner, uh, for joining us today. And she is a writer and editor, great granddaughter of Mary Jones Parish, who documented the remarkable story of the Tulsa, Oklahoma massacre a hundred years ago. And Annalise was speaking to me there from Tulsa.